Welcome to The More Perfect Union, a podcast about the joy we get from American politics, or as we like to call it, real debate without the hate. I'm Rebecca Kushmeider, your very liberal Democrat coming from Maryland. I'm DJ McGuire, your Republican in exile from Suffolk, Virginia. I'm Kevin Kelton, a moderate Democrat living in Los Angeles, California. I'm Helena Henry, your evangelical conservative from Colleyville, Texas. And I'm Greg Matuzek, your Catholic Democrat from Cincinnati, Ohio. The More Perfect Union can be heard on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and our website, themoreperfectunionpodcast.com, where you can also find host bios and written commentary. So, this has been quite a week. <laughs> this has been quite a week, part three of 208. Yeah. Oh, stop yeah, it, yeah. DJ. Let's not bring up the 208 number. That's just scary. Come on. <laughs> well, you know, this is the thing. Every week, it seems like this is it. This is the worst week. This is it. This is the worst week. And uh, for Trump, but there has mean. to be. Yes, for Trump. Um, but we were talking about this earlier. There has to be something good as a Democrat, as a liberal, as a progressive. I we try to see the good in some things. And we talked about this earlier. I hope I'm wrong. I hope this is the best thing for the country ever. <laughs> and he succeeds. I've been wrong this past whole year. I never thought he was going to be there. And if I'm wrong and this turns out to be a utopia, I'm fine with it. So maybe we could start this week. In the three weeks, there has to be something good that's happened. (laughs) So there's a couple things, a couple things I would point to. And I I do want to note that I, I don't think there's any value in normalizing or legitimizing the terrible things that the administration has said has done and the ways in which they have really antagonized uh, different groups, particularly people of color. And you're seeing a reaction to the administration from groups of color. For example, the NAACP Awards this weekend had a tribute to Obama uh, in the beginning of the broadcast. So I I don't want to excuse that behavior, but I do think, as you're saying, Greg, that we can identify discrete things that Trump is doing that that are going as well as could be hoped or expected. Those would be the first would be the first would be uh, he uh, seems to be taking a more traditional approach to uh, diplomacy and to how he's handling our relationships with other countries. I'm going to ignore last week's call with Australia and Mexico and things like that. I'm going to focus just on Japan because that went well, seemingly. Uh, you know, we we heard throughout the campaign that he was not happy with the defense agreement we had with Japan, that he was not interested in upholding it in the way it existed before. And now he says he's 100% with Japan. Personally, I'm a fan of the uh, return to normalcy with the one China policy. Uh, and, and that indicates the extent to which his handling of American relationships in the Pacific will be consistent with what previous administrations have Excuse done. Me. Excuse me. Hang on a second. I thought we were talking about the things that Trump did right. Caving on one China was not something that he did right. Telling 25 million Taiwanese who have built a democracy basically from the ground up in the teeth of thousands of missiles being pointed at them, oh, sorry, we really don't care as much about you as the various imports that are sitting on our shelves and all of the consultant consulting fees that the engagement folks get through the various chambers of commerce and everything else. That's not the right thing to do. That's a wrong thing to do. <laughs> That's Donald Trump being – just like a typical politician, which is being tough on China when he runs for office and then caving to the Chinese Communist Party when he enters office. That's what every president, nearly every president has done post Tiananmen Square. It was not the right thing to do. And it actually is another disappointment. It's a reminder that this is actually on foreign policy, with the exception of the relationship with Japan. And yes, he got that right. But he is actually a very weak president. He is letting Vladimir Putin run roughshod in Ukraine. He is letting Bashar Assad kill whoever he wants in Syria. And he is now letting Xi Jinping and his cohorts basically have the same position that they have not earned regarding the Taiwanese democracy that they had in previous administrations. Yes, he got Shinzo Abe right. He didn't get the rest right, at least not from my perspective. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, Well, let me just jump in in and say, first of all, Helena, welcome to the More Perfect Union podcast. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I have been told by DJ that. why you're wrong. You have I've been, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I've had these conversations and, in my head while driving for so long. And, and now, secondly, now boy, that was a short-lived say, celebration of the Trump presidency. Thing. I will say one quick thing, DJ. Whether or not 
there's value in, in pursuing uh, something that's not the one China policy. Trump is not the president I want to have do that, right? If we're going to do something that's a departure from decades of how admitted American administrations have handled foreign policy, I don't want the departure to happen in this administration. So anything he's going to do that is in, in line with and in keeping with historic ways of treating and, and relating to other countries, I'm a fan of. In, in terms of world standing, that's been one of my concerns with the Trump administration from day one, um, his ability and his capacity for messing up our, our relationships worldwide has been terrifying to me. And to see him do something as conventional as, you know, have a nice sit down with, with Prime Minister Abe was kind of a relief, although that handshake was a little bit <laughs> yeah, weird. A little <laughs> aggressive. A little aggressive. And like, and I think, I, you the know, man's for, wrist was at a 90 segment. degree angle. I don't know whether you noticed yeah. that. Yeah, was, for a that segment was, that was supposed to be, hey, let's have some real positive, you know, <laughs> beginnings here. You guys are just... Thing. Oh. You guys are just <laughs> all over him. So come on. Well, look, um, there's there's another thing he's doing well. I, I, I'm i going to give him the benefit of the doubt and assume it's intentional. But okay. his cabinet members and nominees have had a tremendous degree of autonomy. They've had the ability to openly depart from positions he's taken or criticize his positions. You see uh, DHS Secretary John Kelly who criticized the, the ban rollout. Rex Tillerson has talked about climate change, his support of NATO. Jim Mattis talks about NATO, waterboarding. He talks about Russia as a threat, not you know a, an ally who is more innocent than we are. Uh, I, I think that could either be mismanagement or it could be uh, a, a leadership style that allows for uh, diverse thought, essentially. I think it's complete delegation. I think he's told these people, all right, now this is your this is your job. Go do it. Um, and I'm not you know, I'd be curious to to be a fly on the wall when he actually hears about these statements of dissent and to see how he responds and if it's going to be duplicated. And Rebecca, you had an interesting experience tonight, I believe. Didn't you uh, go to a, a town hall with your local congressman? I did. It was a, a town hall, actually, at my own church. And while everyone else was listing their religions, I didn't get a chance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I have one, the godless atheist that I am. I have a religion. I'm I'm Unitarian Universalist and have been my whole life. Um, so my church hosted my new congressman, Jamie Raskin. He's a freshman this year from uh, Montgomery County, Maryland. And he's he's really, you know, remarkable in a in a very unreconstructed left wing liberal intellectual sort of way. He's a he's a constitutional law professor, literally. That's that was his job before getting elected to um, the state Senate and then to the House of Representatives. And, you know, he's, he's sort of making some minor waves in the party as being almost, um, you know, a, a standard bearer for the left wing style of populism that we're seeing with, uh, you know, these these very organic protests that are rising. Well, they might be organic. They might be paid by George Soros and nobody <laughs> seems to know <laughs> what, what hey, the now. genesis of protesting is. But I haven't gotten a check. That's all I can I, for sure. I remember it was 25 years ago when George Soros crashed the British pound, knocked them out of the exchange rate mechanism, and saved Great Britain from the Eurozone. I am very much a right-wing person, but I will not tolerate any criticism of George Soros. He saved the United Kingdom. Thank you. Okay. He, uh, You're he welcome. paid me for the protest I've been to, GJ. This is clearly he's, – he's fallen down on the job. Um, but it, you know, it was a great event because it, you know it was it was more people than I've ever seen show up at my church, which maybe tells you something about my church, um, <laughs> or tells you something about my community. It was you know there's there's a thirst for reassurance on the left right now, and Raskin is one of the people who's able to provide it actually kind of nicely and, and not spell out the 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 writing of the the apocalypse for us. He's he's able to really say to us, listen, these are the challenges we have ahead, but there are also ways that we can address them. And I, I found it, you know, very uplifting kind of evening. Um, and it, you know, it, it made me feel like what I've been doing as the opposition has has been right on that, that you know, the protests matter, the the underground organizing, it, underground isn't even the right word. It's it just the, the non-obvious organizing 
um, it, it matters. And, and, you know, kind of keeping the momentum and keeping in mind that it's a marathon and not a sprint is, is going to have an effect, maybe not today, maybe not even in six months, but in 2018, we're going to start to see things wobble in, in interesting directions if we can keep this all up. Well, let me ask you this, so, Rebecca. Um, I assume, I mean, obviously there are Trump supporters and there are Trump critics at your, at your church. What was the mood like and what was the interaction like between them? Um, there was a Trump supporter. <laughs> One. <laughs> okay. The, you know, I, I live in one of the bluest of the blue counties in a very blue state. Um, so it was, this was a revival meeting of the, of okay. the far left. There, there, there were, you know, some criticisms that came up in the Q&A. Somebody who was clearly a Bernie supporter who was disgruntled um, at, it, you know, the feeling that the Democratic establishment was, was pro-Hillary. Um, and then there was a woman who, who you know, got up and, and said flat out, I disagree with you on a lot of things. And one of the things that really bothered her was that Congressman Raskin had not attended the inauguration. He'd been one of the 70 or so members of the House who didn't go. And, you know, he addressed it actually fairly gracefully. And, you know, and talked about how he had attended the the swearing in of our Republican governor in our state. Um, but, you know, his feelings about Trump are something different than mainstream Republicanism. Um, and, and that, you know, this is a man who is operating outside of a lot of political and social norms, and we should treat him as such. And there's another thing I wanted to bring up this week, which is politics uh, in the world of satire. I don't know how much we've talked about it in past episodes, but Saturday Night Live obviously is having a renaissance year with the Alec Baldwin impression of Donald Trump. They had Alec Baldwin hosting last night, and of course he did another Donald Trump piece in the middle of the show. But they also did pieces with Kate McKinnon as Kellyanne Conway, and also they had uh, Melissa McCarthy back playing Sean Spicer. And in that sketch, they also had Kate McKinnon playing Jeff Sessions. So they seem to want to be poking a little bit at the bear, especially with the females playing men in the Trump administration, which, uh, as everybody has heard through the rumor mill, apparently bothers the new president to no end. (laughs) It's funny that having a woman play uh, the male figures in his administration is so offensive to Trump, but having a Dementor skeleton play Bannon apparently did not (laughs) like... Yeah, he probably liked that. And and I'll (laughs) I'll tell you what was really meant to bother Donald Trump last night in last night's episode was uh, Leslie Jones playing Donald Trump. Now, the way they presented it, I don't know whether you guys saw it or not. It happened later in the show. It was a filmed piece in which Leslie Jones, uh, you know, ostensibly wanting to get more airtime, decided to go to Lorne Michaels and show her version of a Donald Trump impersonation. The premise being that Alec Baldwin cannot, you know, be there every week to play Donald Trump. Uh, And so, of course, Leslie Jones got into the blonde wig, the blonde eyebrows, put on the Donald Trump suit and did several scenes in that character. Now, that piece could have stood on its own because it's very funny to see, you know, a black woman wanting to play Donald Trump. But beyond that, they did that piece because as much as we've heard that it bothers Donald Trump to see Sean Spicer uh, portrayed by a woman, it must bother the heck out of Mr. Trump to see... (laughs) a black female comedian like Leslie Jones portraying him. And I would not you know be surprised his, if they do that again. It's his own fault. He has let us see his underbelly over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, comedians are not people who pull their punches. They're going to aim for his soft carts. Mm-hmm. And, if you know, I heard that Sean Spicer actually <laughs> wanted to go out into his next press briefing with a super soaker to, you know, to, to totally... <laughs> you know, diffuse the situation. And that would have been genius. Yes. And Melissa McCarthy could have, you know, been like, oh, ha ha, we're all in on this. But but Trump vetoed it and wouldn't let him go out there with a super soaker. So he was left with with no weapons in his own arsenal. And, you know, Melissa McCarthy could come back stronger than ever for a second week. And you wait, know, so, is- so you're saying, wait, wait. So you're saying Sean Spicer actually does have a sense of humor and is able to be self-effacing. And maybe it's because I don't I don't know the guy personally. He he rarely calls me up on the weekends anymore. But, uh, <laughs> that's so sad, Greg. <laughs> if ever. And maybe that's why I've got a bone to pick with him. But he just seems like so difficult. And like if anyone needs a laugh, it's him. And he's just been holding it in since nine years old. 
And I mean, because I have heard, I I know people who know Sean Spicer, and and they say that he's a great guy. That he's you know he's he's pleasant and and nice to be around. So he never might have calls said, me. Well, you know, Greg, <laughs> maybe you're asking yeah. for it. I yeah. you know. Oh and, yeah, it's me. And, and it's my <laughs> fault. I'm asking for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, <laughs> and circling back to SNL, you know who else appeared on SNL last night, or actually was portrayed on SNL last night? The three Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals judges who ruled oh my God, against that Trump sketch this was week. So funny. That was so in, funny. In a in a, a people's court <laughs> sketch with Donald Trump oh on one God. side and the three judges on the other. Um, but let's talk about the actual Ninth Circuit ruling. As an attorney, <laughs> Helena, what's your takeaway? So uh, essentially what the court did is they declined to stay the trial court order that came from Judge Robart in Seattle. And that was a nationwide ban, essentially, of the ban. So saying the ban can't happen anymore. Uh, the administration put forth some really problematic arguments with the Ninth Circuit, which I think is what resulted in a problematic decision. The administration argued that the executive's actions here, that Trump's actions were essentially unreviewable because they were on issues of immigration and national security. The court disagreed. They said that they have the authority to adjudicate these types of issues. And they said the administration didn't give the appropriate evidence that anyone from the seven nations that are on the ban had committed any terrorist attacks. So uh, l- l- let me ask you this. We, we, okay, you've now outlined what the outcome was from the Ninth Circuit. What do you think, based on that, the, the Trump administration is going to do going forward? Obviously, they have a range of options. Do you think they're going to rewrite the, the uh, executive order, or do you think they're going to just try to litigate this? Or do you think they'll do both? I think what they should do, they should rewrite the order and not make it so objectionable. Yeah, I think so, um, too. They can take out the you know, legal permanent resident components. They can take out the, the problematic green card language. They can take out the religious test language. Um, but, you know, there's another problem that I think the administration is not appreciating, and that is when you put forth bad arguments, you, you really run the risk of getting bad precedent. And what you got out of this ruling here is uh, pretty much wholesale creation of new due process rights that arguably – should not exist in the jurisprudence um, rights for people that haven't even entered the country uh, to have the opportunity to uh, get notice and the opportunity to respond in the hearing um, about their rights. And you also have a standing problem that came out of this case that some people are talking about, but I think not enough. So uh, the states of Washington and Minnesota brought a suit on behalf of their citizens and themselves as state saying our universities are being harmed and you know our tax base is affected, and uh, the court really ran with that. And uh, what the, what the Trump administration is doing is they're getting bad law on the books that will impact their executive authority going forward, and it's unnecessary if they just crafted the order differently. Well, this is this is what happens when you have presidential overreach. You had the Nixon administration was famous for presidential overreach for all of its six years, and Congress responded with congressional overreach, from which we still have not recovered. But which everyone acknowledged at the time, and I think would acknowledge today, is still better than executive overreach. We're now dealing with judicial overreach in the case of the Ninth Circuit, or as they're best known, the Ninth Circus. I mean, Trump may be Trump, but the Ninth Circus is still the Ninth Circus. But the fact of the matter is, our choices were either creating new judicial overreach, which is what this opinion has done, or allowing continued executive overreach. And I think most Americans would decide, still decide today that judicial overreach is better than executive overreach. I think it's it's a matter of a case by case. We're not going to get into that. The bigger issue, again, as I've always said, is that this is just flat out bad policy. Period. Yeah, that, absolutely. And I do want to note. Well, it won't. But I do want to note the Ninth Circuit. You know, th- this case is still active. The the only thing they decided is whether to state the decision of the trial true. court, not whether that was correct. So there's still like a scheduling order or at least briefing due dates in the Ninth Circuit um, that the administration and plaintiffs are going to have to argue. So so the case is still proceeding. And I think to sort of loop in what DJ was saying about this being bad policy, and to kind of get to another another topic, is. This order was written in concert between Steve Bannon, who's rumored, if not proved, to be a white supremacist who doesn't like Muslims. And, There's no rumor uh, there. He, he yeah, is. no rumor. Yeah, it. okay. So Steve okay. Bannon, who's a schmuck, um, and <laughs> and a and a senior White House policy advisor named Stephen Miller, who's this 31 year old who's come off. I think he was a Senate Judiciary Committee staffer, isn't that right? That's and correct. basically. 
He yeah. looks like every Hill intern who was boring his date to death at Tortilla Post. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's only and he's only thirty one years old. Uh, in, but in Washington years, that that can mean something different. You know, he he looks like he thinks he's a policy wonderkind. And right. actually, he, you know, he may have gotten his job by being the only millennial who was grossed out when Kirk kissed Uhura. I, I'm not super... <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> Salute, Rebecca. Salute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so we've got these two people who are not particular, you know, like, like Steve Bannon may have gone to Stephen Miller and said, all right, we want a Muslim ban, but make it sound law-y and not illegal. To my knowledge, I, I don't think he attended law school. I know he went to Duke. Um, and I oh, think that's God, I hate Duke. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to be the, uh, I'm going to be this, the, I'm going to come back to actually saying things nice about the Trump administration because Stephen Miller was on at least two of the morning shows uh, this week. He was on Meet the Press and uh, George Stephanopoulos and Chris Wallace. So he was on three. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought he came off actually quite well. I mean, compared what? to... Compared to what I have heard out of other Trump administration officials, although I did not agree with his arguments, they were well presented. Uh, I, I really thought that his presentations were quite good, and I was actually heartened that there was someone in this administration that can talk. Oh, I, was, I, felt, I saw a Twitter rumor that he was being fed answers on a teleprompter. Yeah, you actually, <laughs> you actually saw him. You saw him moving his lips and and going. His eyes were going like left to right. No wonder he was drinking point. water while he was speaking. Oh my <laughs> gosh, he uh, Meet the Press was a disaster for him when when he was like, Chuck answered, asked and answered. Moving on, he was he was terrible. <laughs> I say that to my or... kids sometimes. Asked and answered. I mean, man. <laughs> Yeah. That's a line. <laughs> That's an objection in a deposition. <laughs> That's what that is. He was he was terrible on Meet the Press. Okay, um, well I did my best trying to say something nice about the Trump administration. I, I, I am, can't say I am anything now done. nice about him. I am out of stuff. <laughs> that may all very well be, but while all of this brouhaha was going on, um, Donald Trump did manage to succeed in partially filling some of his cabinet. He had his attorney general confirmed. He had his education secretary confirmed. And I think he even had his health and human services secretary confirmed on Friday, if memory serves. The big brouhaha for the week had been initially the education secretary, Ms. DeVos, who needed uh, the vice, vice president Pence's tie-breaking vote to get confirmed. At least that was until debate shifted to the Sessions nomination, which then turned into an argument about what is and what isn't acceptable criticism of a United States senator and how can people give Elizabeth Warren even more airtime, which is essentially what happened when Mitch McConnell said, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell decided that Elizabeth Warren couldn't read a letter from Coretta Scott King criticizing Jeff Sessions personally because of Senate rule something, something, something or other that doesn't allow that to happen, which goes rule all the 19. way back to Rule 19. I will have to say I do have a take on this, but I will let – let because Greg clearly wants to sound off on our new education. Oh, my gosh. So well, go first of all, am I the only one who actually, like, maybe hopes of hopes, maybe thought she wasn't going to get in? Or were you guys thought – was I the only one? When a third dissenting GOP voice didn't turn up on the same day that Collins and Murkowski defected, I knew it wasn't – it was going to come to Pence. Okay, I was teaching that day. I was in a, I was at a high school class, and another teacher walked in, uh, walked into my class and said, "By the way, DeVos made it." And I looked at my class. I said, uh, uh, "Why don't you guys work in groups now?" I guess I can do that. I was substitute teaching, and they're like, "Okay." And then we went in and screamed, just literally screamed obscenities at each other. Like, Ma, I can't believe this. We were actually shocked. And in that time, she has shut down access for parents with uh, children with dis disabilities uh, to websites. She sent out two tweets with uh, spelling mistakes. I mean, set protests at public schools. Well, this, right. this is all well and good, but I'm not sure that, that the best argument to put forward, Greg, is that you were so offended by the person who has become the U.S. Education oh, Secretary I know. that I you know abandoned that your classroom. Class. <laughs> oh, never said, by the way, yeah. I never said I was a good Support teacher. Support school choice. <laughs> I never said I was a good teacher. Um, 
this is what she's done to us. She's already made me a worse teacher. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, I am a proponent of school choice. I think that a lot of people exercise school choice by moving into the right public school district. And that's a privilege that, you know, wealthier people didn't have. I'm not a proponent of having inexperienced people who don't have the right qualifications having the job. So I think for me, I, I divorced the two issues. Let me say something real quick. Helena, um, our senator, Rob Portman, who, by the way, took $51,000 from Betsy DeVos for his campaign and voted for her, actually sent this out to his uh, constituents. Betsy DeVos' parents, one of them was a teacher. This makes her qualified. She comes from a lineage of education. That was his opening line. Thus, my mother, who worked in a bank, I should be able to run the treasury. <laughs> Okay. My dad was a doctor. I could be secretary. I could be surgeon general. And and that was his that was his justification for hire. And he said, and although it wasn't the best interview and best uh, hearings, he said she did say yes on a couple things that he really liked. Are you mm -hmm. kidding? My biggest regret over all of this, my biggest regret is that I didn't ha have fifty two thousand dollars to pay <laughs> off Rob Portman because I know his price now. At this point, it's not the question that he's a whore because he is because, oh because he takes money. He, he takes up. money. And this is and th money for things that are morally ambiguous, like selling children's and selling children's future. And that's what he does. And his price, we know, is fifty one thousand. Now, if I had and fifty th this, two and, thousand and this, and this is Senator Rob <laughs> Portman, let us be clear, Rob, you took money from a woman and sold out their futures. So if I had fifty two thousand or let's just say it this way, if I had 30 pieces of silver, cool, that works, too, then. You, I would pay your price. My and, God, and, we are and, so and, gonna and, end up in a re-education camp. And, <laughs> and, and, and I would say that Greg's that Greg's tirade <laughs> is one of the reasons why Democrats will probably look back on this three to four years from now if they are smart, and actually be glad that the DeVos nomination went through. And here's why: DeVos but, was nominated. DeVos herself has been a very big proponent of of school choice and of, and, and of educational reform, but she has her own personal, she has her record flaws, her public record flaws, et cetera, et cetera. Had she failed nomination and Donald Trump responded with Michelle Rhee or Eva Moskowitz, Democrats would have been in a complete world of hurt. Education Secretary Eva Moskowitz would have run circles around the opposition. She would have been pushing charter schools and school choice on the front line every single day, every single week, and she would have had arguments that would have flattened the opposition with relish repeatedly. This would have been, because school, school choice is the issue that made Wisconsin a Republican state in the 1980s and the 1990s. School choice is the issue that Mike Bloomberg turned to make himself from an accidental mayor to a colossus in New York City. This is an issue where Democrats have serious problems with their own base. Betsy DeVos will make sure that none of that is realized for the Republicans because she has her own stains on her record and everything else that was talked about. But had they gotten Moskowitz or Michelle Rhee, particularly Eva Moskowitz, Democrats would have been in very, very big trouble on this. They actually got lucky that that it's Betsy DeVos as the voice for school choice and school reform for had it been Eva Moskowitz, Democrats would have been losing battles for the next four years on this issue. Okay. And with DJ, while we're, while you're going, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, the sessions, Elizabeth Warren, yeah, Mitch McConnell, yeah. brouhaha. So why don't we kind <laughs> of segue you. to that? Yeah. And this, this is a perfect example in my opinion of how, the Republicans are essentially playing three-dimensional chess and the Democrats are playing tiddlywinks. <laughs> <laughs> because prior to prior to Elizabeth Warren reading Scaretta, Co Coretta Scott King's letter and prior to Mitch McConnell trying to silence her for it over Rule 19 and everything else that went down, Jeff Sessions had some serious issues on his right as he went to the floor for confirmation. There could have been pressure placed on Ron Paul. There could have been pressure placed on Lindsey Graham. There could have been pressure placed on John McCain. There could have been pressure placed on Mike Lee. There could have even been some pressure, although I don't think it would have been enough to change his mind, even placed on Ted Cruz, who has 
and generally burnish tries to burnish his libertarian reputation within the Republican Party. Instead, Elizabeth Warren reads her letter from Coretta Scott King, taking us all back to 1986, and Mitch McConnell, rather brilliantly, makes sure everything is frozen there by keeping her quiet with the rule, well, keeping her quiet on the Senate floor, with Rule 19, which now assures all of the air gets sucked out of the room for everything that I just talked about. All the pressures that would be placed on Graham and Paul and McCain and Lee and Cruz vanish in the wind. And we all go back to what was or what wasn't in the minds of Martin Luther King Jr.'s widow in 1986. At the same time, the Democratic candidate for 2020, who is arguably the most divisive, the least liked outside of her party, and the worst political campaigner, and I have data from 2012 to, pr- to buttress my claim, is the one that gets the spotlight placed on her for the entire week. Mitch McConnell essentially made it easier for Jeff Sessions to get nominated, consolidated the Republican coalition, and put forward arguably the weakest Democratic candidate for 2020. It was a triple win. And the best part was, for him, is that so many Democrats don't even actually realize what he did to them. Okay. Well, I just want to jump in and and build on that thought because I agree with a lot of what you said, DJ. Uh, And one other thing that I saw happening a lot on uh, social media this week was Democrats starting to criticize Elizabeth Warren uh, much the same way that uh, Democrats criticized Hillary Clinton uh, during the primary season and even in the run-up to the general election. And I wrote a piece about this that's on our website, moreperfectunionpodcast.com. Democrats better be very careful of this. DJ, you may be right. She may not be the strongest or anywhere near the strongest candidate for Democrats to nominate in 2020. But she also may end up being our standard bearer. And if we start this process again, where Democrats start beating her up from the left, which will only give ammunition to the right once we get uh, you know past the 2018 elections and uh, she is obviously going to take a shot at running for the nomination it's a very dangerous thing for democrats to do a lot of it is misogynistic and again i would you know if you want to see me expand more on this please go to uh, moreperfectunionpodcast.com and read the commentary that i wrote there but i think it's a big mistake for democrats to start getting misogynistic on elizabeth warren this far in advance of 2020 well, can, can, can we say that it's a mistake for anybody to get misogynistic on anyone? No. I mean, yes. let's just take a step back and, <laughs> and, and, and say, you know, I think that's a, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and, you know, if, if, if you're, if you're going to criticize the fact that Elizabeth Warren is a woman, yeah, that's stupid. If you're going to criticize her tone of voice or something, yeah, that's stupid. Well, that's a lot of what if I saw. One guy wrote yeah, something to the effect of um, when she talks, her tone is so annoying, I just want to tell her to shut up. That kind of stuff really has no place in, in and, politics. And, and, and she's going to swap that stuff aside fairly easily. That's not, that's not the problems Elizabeth Warren has going forward. Uh, the most important uh, topic that we cannot end the week without hitting on was something that uh, Rebecca alluded to a little while ago, the Nordstrom's debacle. Yes, yeah. the, the Battle of Nordstrom. The, <laughs> the Nordstrom <laughs> Massacre, I think it was. Yeah, the Nordstrom's Massacre. Yeah, the, Nordst- the Nordstrom Massacre. Basically, Nordstrom is going to stop selling Ivanka Trump's clothes. What? Um, I know! The horrors! Apparently, they're not selling. Probably because they're designed for somebody who is built like Ivanka Trump. And most of us aren't. And Did Donald Trump it? got really really mad apparently that is the greatest injustice ever committed in the history of time that ivanka is such a good person that nordstrom should be selling her clothes for all eternity you also have kellyanne conway committing ethical violations advertising ivanka's yes. brand right. but here's on what I television find, right. here's what i find right. so amusing about well the, the whole thing is amusing from top to bottom so kellyanne conway made inappropriate comments and she was jumped on by people from the left and the right. Uh, Jason Chaffetz uh, even came out, you know, saying that what she did might be a, a potential violation of the law. So Sean Spicer, in one of, I thought, his better moments of the week, uh, mentioned that, yes, uh, we're aware of that, and Kellyanne Conway had been counseled about it. And then he moved on. Great. That would have closed the issue. But Donald Trump, once again, not being able to take a win and walk away got upset that his own spokesperson said that one of his staffers needed to be counseled. 
and he made a huge issue out of his own spokesman's term and took umbrage with that. The man is insane. The, the, this well, man is in no way, shape, or form capable of of running U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> if he gets upset you, when you, his own spokesman says something as mild as, yes, she was counseled and, and we've handled it. Did well, you guys see that... the original tweet, by the way, where he said, you know, Nordstrom's no longer handling it. Uh, Ivanka's a wonderful person. She's always pushing me to do good things. That was the quote. <laughs> And which, okay, not pushing hard enough. She well, needs to push the question harder. Is, really shove. Who needs to be pushed? This is the thing that bothers me. Who needs to be pushed to do good things? I mean, <laughs> that's the craziest ass thing that I've ever heard of. Like, I sometimes need to like push my like seven year old daughter like <laughs> to do the right thing. Not <laughs> shirt things off the ground I need to or push to brush myself out the door to the gym because right. she's a child. But well, I don't have to push you to do good things. Don't strangle a cat. Things. Don't do stuff like that. He's a psycho. Well, you know, she tells me not to push this big shiny red button. That's a good thing, I guess. Well, I want to, um, you know, pick up on what Greg said about urging people to do good. I'd like to urge DJ to do good by taking us home. Well, first of all, thank you all for listening tonight. Please follow us on Twitter at mpu podcast and on facebook at facebook.com slash more perfect union podcast you can share our link on your facebook timeline so your friends can discover us as well and if you enjoy political debates and would like to be part of ours please join us in facebook on our political discussion group open fire we're all there although i usually drop teasers now so you can listen to this and we'd love to see you there too until next time have a great week DJ's wearing Ivanka right now. (laughs) (laughs) Who knew he's still a size two? (laughs) Yeah, and Greg is wearing Jessica Simpson, so let's (laughs) do it.